Good would morning, Hampton Church. Would y'all join us in wishing Caitlin a happy birthday as she walks out? Yay. Happy birthday, Caitlin. We love you. We're so glad you were born. <laughs> we're glad you're here at Heritage Church this morning. My name is Michael. I'm one of the pastors here. This is Pastor Suzanne. If you don't mind pulling, and if, as you can see, the storm hit us because it took out the center channel on our video stuff. So, so much for that. And, and the internet is not back up to snuff either. So anybody that's streaming online now, they'll get a recording later. So we'll pretend like they're in the room, but they're not really. All right. So if you don't mind, pull out the announcement sheet you were handed at the door. You can tear it off on three. One, two, three. Uh, okay. All right. I'll, I'll go with that. All right. <laughs> Fill that out. Last name for uh, last name and first name of family members here with you today. If you don't mind any information you're comfortable updating, we won't misuse it. We we'll just we send you information about the church and get off that list anytime you want. And we'll talk about this again at the end of the service. If you're our guest here this morning, we welcome you. We know that you have many choices and places to worship, so it's a gift to have you with us today. Make sure you fill out that connection card Michael was talking about. We would love to send a sweet treat from us to you. And if after sitting through the service, Heritage doesn't feel like that's the place for you, please let us know. There are some great churches in our community, and we would love to connect you to a church where you could grow in your relationship with God and where you could serve the wonderful community in which we find ourselves. Each and every month at Heritage, we do one thing to make a difference. And this month, and we're getting ready for what's going to happen next month. Our March one thing is uh, for Egg the City. Egg the City is our Easter event. It's one of our largest events that we do each and every year for the community, but we need lots and lots of candy. Think about when you're buying it that it fits inside of an egg. You know, if you buy like a long candy bar, it's not going to fit inside an egg. So something kind of small that goes in an egg. We would prefer no chocolate because you never know how hot it's going to be um, when the uh, hunt occurs. But if you'd like to help us with that, you can put it in the bin as you come in the door on your way in. And then each and every week, we give you an opportunity to serve. And this morning, our serving opportunity is on our event team. We do have lots of events that we do during the year. And I know that some of y'all plan good parties. And so if you're good at that and that's your jam, we would love to have you be a part of our event team. Just put that on the back of your connection card. And there is a flyer in your announcement sheet this morning as well, if you would be one of the uh, helpers and servers at Egg the City. So this morning, we are wrapping up our Love Story message series. And it felt a little more appropriate in February, but it kind of oozed over into March, didn't it? But Love Story is, has been a series based on the book of Scripture called Song of Songs. Raise your hand if you've read something from Song of Songs at some point in your life. Let me at see. At church does There count. you go. No, no, at church does count. Does so it? if you've been here, you should definitely, it does count. Um, you know, but in, but in Song of Songs, it's just eight short chapters. And if you haven't read it, read it, and you'll be like, "Wow, this is this is kind of this is this is different." But but read it because the imagery and the language is beautiful. Initially, they thought maybe it was a story of God and Israel or Christ and the church. But in recent years, theologians have determined that they really believe it's just a story of a man and a woman. It's love poetry. Um, and so if you uh, want to read it, go off and read it. But maybe you've stumbled in here this morning and you're like, darn, I missed all the messages before that. We got you covered. When the internet's working, <laughs> we, they're all online. You can go back. First week, we talked about loving well. The second week, we talked about seasons in our relationships. Last week, we talked about conflict in our relationships because that's just part of our relationships. And this week, we're going to talk about love in action. Now, I used to be an English teacher, and so I'm all about nouns and verbs. And a lot of times we talk about love as a noun, but what is love? Love is a, say it with me, a verb, right? And in this world, we get so distracted by all the things happening, the phone ringing, places we got to go, the chores we've got to do, the job we've got to do, what the kids need. We kind of sometimes forget to focus on our relationships. But we have good intentions. I mean, it's so true that there's actually a saying. Have you all ever heard this saying? The road is paved with good intentions, yeah. right? I mean, I've done that my whole life. Is New Year's, New Year's resolutions, what are they? Good Very intentions. Good intentions, but not so much on the action. What do they call it, though? Like uh, by February 9th, it's like National Quit Day or something, right? Yeah. It, has, it, has, you know, it has a day. But, but there are other times, like when I was in school, when I was in middle school, we probably have some middle schoolers in here and high schoolers in here, and even in college, mostly middle and high school, um, I would go to my locker. You know, back in the day, we had the lockers. You go to the locker, and I would always put my books in, the, in my backpack, and I would carry them home. 
but then I wouldn't study. Did anybody, anybody do that? I lugged books for years. I got, I got a back of steel from that when I was in school, right? Well, I mean, I, I had a good intention, but I didn't follow through the action. What about when the new year starts or at any time? We just decide, I'm going to start working out. Five days a week. That's where we always start. We always start with five, right? We don't start with one. We, we won't work out five days a week. And then that week, we go off and we have wings three days of the five days instead of working out. Anybody done that? Or somebody does something nice for you. Someone ever done something nice for you? You're like, oh, man, I really, really need to write them a thank you note. I'm going to remember to do that because, you know, thank you notes are golden in today's world, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a really nice thank you note. And then that new Netflix series comes out and the note doesn't get right. Yeah. And, and what about this? This is the classic. This is the class. This is it. I, this happens to me all the time. I'm sure it happens to you. So you're in Publix, right? We're out somewhere, and you run into a friend. You run into a friend from somewhere. You haven't seen them. Hey, how are you? It's so good to see you. And someone inevitably will say, let's get together. Yeah, that's a great idea. And then what happens? We don't. And maybe even, you know, in your family, you've been planning this trip. We're going to go on this trip, and we're going to do this amazing thing. And you just can never seem to find the right time. Now, the problem that comes for us when it comes to this, you know, this tension, this gap between intentions and actions is that we tend to judge other people by their actions. You know, kind of, what have you done for me lately? But we judge ourselves by our intentions. Well, I was gonna. I was gonna. Now, the Apostle John writes to us in 1 John, he says this, he says, little children, he's talking mm-hmm. to all of us, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. You know, we can say, I love you all we want, but if we don't put the action in behind it, it changes everything. And so how do we embody, how we choose to embody love affects our relationships. So if you say to someone, you know, I was going to do this. Michael says, I was going to do it. I meant to do it. I know. I got too busy. How does the other person feel when you start saying that? It doesn't feel like you're a, a priority, does it? And it, and it sounds kind of empty and hollow and lackluster and, In some senses, it's kind of like an excuse. But there is nothing better than being able to see love. Michael has this little thing he does, and I don't know if he does it intentionally. I don't know. But uh, whenever I do something for him, I'll say, hey, I did this. I I made this for you, or I got that ready for you so you don't have to mess with it or whatever. He will look at me, and instead of saying thank you, he'll say this. He'll say, I love you too. You know, because the things we do do show love, don't we? But I think most of us, we intend good. Don't we all have good intentions? All of us, we, we, would, we know we could do better. But we've got to put our love into action. In the book of James, we're told that, that we're not to be hearers of the word. We're to be doers of the word. We're to be doers in our relationships. That's how we put our love into action. We can all do better, but we need to close the gap between our intentions and our actions. You know, so how do we do this? How do we close that gap? And there's, there's a couple different categories we need to think of when we're talking about closing the gap. And the, the first one is you need to close the gap between what you think and what you say. Mm-hmm. Um, we, uh, she told me a long time ago when we first got together, and she had received it from a college professor of hers. It's like, and the question he put forward to his students was, how can we always think nice things to say and it never comes out of our mouth? How can we do that? How can, why, why don't we just make it, if, if it hits our brain and it's nice to say, it just comes out of our mouth naturally. She'll like be walking by complete strangers in the store and go, your hair looks great today, right? You know what that does for somebody for the day when you just thought something nice about somebody, even a complete stranger, and just kind of laid it out for them, right? Who would reject that? You know, and that's her superpower is encouragement. Me, it was, uh, it was mind-blowing that anyone would do that because I never grew up in encouragement or any of that, right? And so to be able to, wow, I could put words to my thoughts? Really? And that's okay? You know, and because most of my thoughts, you don't want words to them. But, um, you know, and we, we want to be good we want to say good things. And you know, the scripture even says, it says in Proverbs, it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruits. And so our challenge today is that every time you think something nice about your significant partner this week, say it. Put words to it. Nice blazer. Thank you. You're welcome. I like this blazer. <laughs> See? See, it works. 
Don't just say the bad thing. See, that's the thing. We, we critique our partners all day long, right? We'll critique them in our head. We'll critique them out loud. You know how damaging that is to a relationship to be critiqued day in and day out? But we never say the good things. We never say the good things. Don't just say the bad things and rob them of the blessing of the good. Say the good things. You know, Solomon, in, in the Song of Songs, and I've got a little uh, reading for you again today. Oh, here we go, friends. In the Song of Songs, chapter 7, and, and this, is, this is him speaking to her, and he is laying it on, right? He is checking her out from her feet to the top of her head, and he's letting her know exactly how he feels about it, right? So I'm going to give you a little, <clears throat> a little reading, because he, he's got game. <laughs> Solomon's got game, okay? And it's pretty spicy, so, uh, you know, little kids, plug your ears. All right, <laughs> this is in your Bible, y'all. He says, he's looking at her, and he goes... How beautiful are your sandaled feet, O prince's daughter. Your graceful legs are Stop like jewels, it. the work of an artist's hands. Your navel is a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. Now I have to put it down for this because I've got to do the motions. Your waist is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. Your breasts, I won't do the motion, your breasts are like two fawns, <laughs> like twin fawns of a gazelle. She's got a hairy chest, evidently. Okay, your <laughs> neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are like the pools of Heshbon by the gate of Bathrabim. Do you know where that is? I don't know. It's by Bathrabim. <laughs> your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon looking toward Damascus. <laughs> your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. Your hair is of royal tapestry. The king is held captive by his tresses. Girl, your hair has got me tied in knots, right? How beautiful you are and how pleasing, my love, with your delights. And then he goes in for the kill. Your stature is like that of a palm and your breasts like clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree and take hold of its fruit. <laughs> Y'all, this is in your Bible, all right? <laughs> Have fun, kids, finding that one. <laughs> song of song, seven. Okay. <laughs> I mean, he's got game, doesn't he? Like he's sitting there, he's just letting, he's letting her have it from the bottom to the top. He's letting her know exactly what he feels about her, how amazing she is to him. And she's responding to this, right? You know, I heard, uh, I heard another pastor say his wife does this to him all the time. What's the three most common words we say in a significant relationship? What is it? I love you, right? We say it all the time. We say it all the time. And he says his wife never says it without adding one word at the end, because. So good. That is good. I love you because. Hmm. I love you because when you smile, you're the most beautiful woman in the room. <laughs> I love you that you're so tender-hearted that you will take care of people that everybody else is ignoring. Hmm. I love you that you love me in spite of me. <laughs> I'd love you to because I wish you would stop. <laughs> Doesn't it change? Doesn't it change the I love you into something very specific and very special? Doesn't it change the nature of that? So this week, when you think something, say it. And when you say I love you, add a because. Add a because this week. You know, the truth is, is whenever we withhold good things, we automatically think the opposite because we have that human negativity bias, which is great when you're out in the savanna and there's bad things out there like, that's a bad thing, that's a bad thing, that's kind of bad, but not, maybe not so bad, that's really bad, right? We have a negativity bias that helped us survive, but at the same time, when we don't hear positive things, that goes to work. You start, if, have you ever done something nice for somebody or you got all dressed up for your partner and you're looking good, sharp, or you're looking pretty, put the makeup on, did the hair, and they said nothing? What's your automatic response in your head about that? Well, I must not look good. They, they must not like me. This isn't special to them, right? Why do we withhold the positive? You know, you never forget that if you want a behavior to be repeated, use positive reinforcement. To compliment the things you want to keep seeing, right? Encourage the things you want to keep seeing in your relationship. Because no, no rep, if there's no feedback, there's going to be no repetition of that behavior. That's just the way we work. And her response, this lady's response is, is, is Solomon is laying it on, man. He's got game. Her response is exactly what we want out of our relationship when we pour on the words and mean them. She says this. She says, I belong to my beloved, 
and his desire is for me. Isn't that what we want out of each and every one of our relationships? Them to know that you belong to me and my desire is for you. You know, if we're going to have a great relationship, then we need to close the gap between intentions and actions. When we think something nice, we should say it. But also when we imagine that we're going to do something nice, we should do it. You ever thought about what thoughtful acts does somebody do that makes you feel loved? I mean, sometimes for our kids, we make their lunch and we put a little note in the lunch. Uh, Michael does something for me every night that's just a little thoughtful thing. I'm, I hope they don't take your man card they can have it. on this. Okay, they can have it. Okay, so so I'm cold a lot. Is anybody else you're just kind of cold, you know? And so just the blanket that we have on our bed just isn't going to be enough. So I have my blankie. I mean, I'm an adult, but I have my little blankie. And so, but every night, you know, I'll, I always get in bed and I always forget to get my blankie, right? And then, huh, you know. But every night, Michael goes over to our little basket where our blanket are and he gets it and he brings it over and he fluffs it out and he kind of like tucks me in every night it's ridiculous but i feel but i feel but i but i feel very very loved that he does that for me and and you know this this piece of scripture that michael read it's a it's a spicy piece of scripture and and men you know y'all y'all like to do romantic gestures i mean y'all know how y'all y'all get the candy y'all get the flowers you'll try to do you know the candlelight thing you know for dinner and all that but gentlemen i just want to share with you this morning is that won't won't get you to where you might like to be. I'll tell you what's even better when it comes to ladies. If you bring us a cup of coffee, mm-hmm, we like that. And if you unload the dishwasher, oh. woo, baby, you got it going on. And hey, if you'll put gas in my car, oh gosh, I am loved. And, and just for me personally, there is nothing sexier than a man using a vacuum cleaner. Can I get an amen? <laughs> There's just something about that. You know, Michael, Michael's very handy. He can fix pretty much anything, and I don't love him anymore, want to be in relationship with him anymore when he's got that tool belt on, doing that honeydew list, right? She thinks my tool belt's sexy. I do, I do. And you know, uh, it's, ladies, you know, we're, we're to do the same things, we, you know, we're, the things that we can do for our spouses. I can tell you that the, a man's number one need is respect. And so one of the things, ladies, it's not just men doing for us. We need to do for them as well. We need to show them our love in action. And one of them is just appreciation. A lot of men uh, go to work every day, come home, they work hard, and no one ever just says thank you. Like, I appreciate what you do to support our family. I appreciate that I never have to take the trash out. I appreciate when an insect or an animal dies, you take care of the carcass. I appreciate that, right? <laughs> I mean, we, we, just, we, just don't, we just don't tell them these things. Um, make their favorite meal. Take them to their favorite place. And sometimes just give them some time just for himself. One of the most loving things I do, and I don't do it enough for Michael, I'll be like, why don't you watch a guy movie and I'll go do something? Because I don't want to watch him anyway, right? So you watch the guy movie and, you know, and go do that, but it's give him some time for himself. And then you have to just think about making some intentional time for each other. None of us, we should never, you know, we, 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 dating is this enormous pursuit and we're going at it with all we've got and then we get married and we just quit. We just quit. We should never stop dating. You know, you are more than your job. You are more than what you do in the house. You are more than being a mom. You are more than being dad. We need this intentional time together to keep our relationship healthy. And one of the number one reasons we need it is, can, is this world stressful? This world is stressful, so we just need to decompress sometime. We need to de get, get alone so we can decompress. Sometimes Michael and I, we have this thing, we kind of work too much. I mean, that's just something that, you know, we kind of do. And sometimes for us to decompress, we'll, you know, we'll say to each other, you know what, we need to get out of town. And we literally will maybe go up to Cool Spring Malls or go to Florence. You know, we're not going up far away, but it just changes your perspective when you can decompress. And it gives you an opportunity to reconnect. And you have to remember that that person is the person you fell in love with. Michael and I, when, we, when our, our daughter was very, very involved in club volleyball when she was in high school, and we were at games all the time, we were at Junior Olympic Nationals, yada, yada, all this, and, and we wound up going on some trip, and we were on a bus, and wherever we were going was like a group of people, and we were on this bus, and we were on there, and we were just kind of talking, and I was watching him talk to other people, and I kind of looked at him, and I was like, oh my goodness, that's Michael, I know that guy, right? <laughs> I know that guy. We need to make intentional time for each other. In the Song of Songs, it speaks to this. In chapter 7, where the scriptures tell us this, it says, Come, my beloved, let us go to the countryside. 
Let's get away. Let us spend the night in the villages. Let us go early to the vineyards to see if the vines have budded, if their blossoms have opened, and if the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. Sometimes you just need to get away. I think one of the reasons that there's this gap between the things we imagine we'll do and the things that we end up doing in our relationships is number one of them is that we kind of tend to take our relationships for granted. Anybody ever been guilty of that? You just assume that your partner is going to be there. We do that in a lot of ways in our, in our lives. And then sometimes we're waiting on them to make the first move. We're waiting on them to be the perfect spouse. And sometimes if you're waiting for the perfect spouse, I got to tell you, you're going to be waiting a long time because there is no, there is no perfect spouse. God's working on all of us. You know, last week Michael shared with you that we'd been married for 20 years. Well, I'd like to correct that and remind you that we've been married for 24 years. But aside, but aside I think I should get credit for time served. But, uh, but, uh, but, but, uh, but aside for that, a, a lot of times I will think about, man, time's a thief. Time is a thief, you know? Mm. It, doesn't seem like it's been, it doesn't seem like it's been that long. And, and Michael truly taught me what love is. And sometimes we can be so consumed just with doing life and careers and serving the church and doing all the things. Sometimes I lament the time that we've wasted. Do you ever lament time that you've wasted? Where you should have just been present for one another? You know, and this isn't, you know, the stuff we're talking about, it's not just true for marriage. You know, as Michael said, you, know, you kind of have to translate it for your context. We do the same thing with our family. Some of us have older parents. You know, how do we show them love? How are we love and action with our families? How do we spend intentional time with our families? My dad went through a major health crisis last year, and we were probably over there probably five, six days a week for, for most, of, most of the year. And now he's doing much, much better. And I just had this thought the other day. I'm like, you know, I haven't, I haven't been by there. I haven't been by there in a couple of weeks. I need mm. to get by there. I need to be intentional about that. And my mama, my mama loves chocolate-covered cherries. And anytime I ever see chocolate-covered cherries, that, there are ways that we can put our love into action in the things we do. And even with our kids, even with our kids, what's a way that we can show love to our kids? When you remember their favorite thing, when you take them to see their, a show at the VBCC of their favorite character, or you get their favorite little character coloring book. But that intentional time, we have a cute little grand girl, and her daddy takes her on daddy-daughter dates, and it is the most precious thing, y'all. And she's in this phase now where she's sick, she likes to model, so she puts on her dress and she gets her hair all done. You know, six years old going out on the town with her daddy, how, how beautiful is that? What a memory. And we do this in our friendships. You know, how do you, how do you show friends love? I, I have a couple friends. Uh, I, I have friends who like certain things. I got a friend who loves penguins. I got a friend who loves, uh, what's a pink, pink thing, pink bird, flamingos. Flamingos, flamingos. Yeah, she loves, yeah, pink bird. Yeah, help me out here. And, and guess what I do every time I see anything with a penguin or a flamingo? I just, it's just silly, it's ridiculous, but I'll get it for them, just to show love for them. I th- don't think I do as well in my friendships with intentional time. I'm not sure any of us do, but we, but we need to. And even in the church, you know, you know, in church, we, we, are, we are a community. We are a family. God has put us together to do life together. And a lot of times, we, we, we don't stop to show love to the people around us. We don't greet the people that are sitting near us. We just come in and sit down on our seats. And we don't just turn and introduce ourselves, those kind of things. And then we don't, uh, you know, we don't encourage people. It was great to see you today. Or if there's opportunities for us to engage, you know, to put the, or the love that we're learning about Jesus into action, we're too busy for it. And I would say if we're too busy to engage with the body of Christ, maybe, just maybe, we are too busy You know, the rhythm of a relationship should be one where we show love and we spend intentional time together. See, sometimes we've just got to say no to the immediate things, the urgent things, the things that must be done, because guess what? They're never going away. They'll they'll never go away. There's always going to be something that needs to be taken care of. But every time you put the things that need to be taken care of above your relationship, you're losing something you're losing something. We need to say yes to our relationships, and we need to remember that love is a verb. And if we want great relationships, we've got to close the gap between our actions and our intentions. You know, so many relationships are in the weeds right now. 
And we know, we get there, we get there, we understand that completely. You know, you get stuck in the ruts, you get busy, you put things on autopilot, and, and next thing you know, you turn around and you're living with a stranger, right? You've kind of drifted apart. It gets off in the weeds like that. And we want our relationship to be different, but then we like look at our spouse and go, well, they need to change, right? They need to change. Here's the truth. If you don't like what you're getting out of your relationship, you need to take a hard look at what you're giving to your relationship. If you don't like what you're getting, take a look at what you're giving. Because you cannot control that other person. The only person you can control is yourself. You can influence them. You cannot control them. So if you don't like what you're getting, take a look at what you're giving. And, you know, it takes two. It does take two. And if you've got bad dynamics in your relationship that you need to undo, so you need to change, then you need to change the way you're operating in your relationship so that it reconnects intentionally, so that it reinvigorates the relationship intentionally, so that it reinforces the love that you share and have shared for a long time for some of you. And men, I'm going to talk to the men now because I'm a man. I can talk to you. I got my man card back. <laughs> and everybody else, just interpret for your context. And women just hit them in the side, all right? Men, uh, we got, the Christian men especially, we got sold this bill of goods where the man is the head of the wife, is what it says in Ephesians 5. It's a horrible translation, number one, but you're missing the complete context of the whole thing because Paul is actually undermining the patriarchal marriage system of the time, and we just don't even read the whole thing. And, and really, the head, it, the, the word kafali means top, it means, it means source, it means things like that, and he's really kind of reflecting on the created order and how things are created in his world, you know, that man was created first, woman come from him. He's, what he's really saying is that, that it comes from that direction down. That's how we're kind of put together. And he's saying, he's saying, men, not that you're first, because we've got a, got a lot of entitled Christian men that think they deserve all kinds of stuff because they're supposed to be in charge. It's not that you come, that you're in charge. What it really means, literally and figuratively, it means you go first. You're the one that's supposed to lead the charge on this. You should be the first one to sacrifice for your relationship like Christ did for the church. You should be the first one to pray over your relationship. You should be the first one, men, to encourage your spouse. You should be the first one to forgive. And you should be the first one to love. We go first. That's what that means. Now, I get it. It does take two, and there's pushback. And some of you have really bad dynamics in your relationship right now, and you've got some major fouls happening, like abuse or lying or infidelity. And I'm not speaking to you today about this. You need a whole other level of help, and I am not downplaying what you're going through at all. Uh, it, you just need a different approach to help heal that relationship. You need some counseling. You need some boundaries put in place. You need to work on some forgiveness and some reconciliation, and that's a whole other process we're talking about. We're just talking about people that are just stuck, right? If you're just stuck and you want different, you cannot do what everybody else does. You have to throw every bit of game you got at this relationship, and I know I'm preaching to myself, right? Because it's not going to happen by accident. It must be intentional. Near the end of the Song of Songs, the woman is receiving all this attention from Solomon, his, his fiance, his wife to be. And she says this, and she finally just relents. She says, place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. It's passion, unyielding as the grave. It burns like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench this love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. Isn't that the, the, the fire and the passion you want for your most significant relationship? That like you two are sealed and bonded, and you're on fire together. Isn't that what you want? That's what God wants for you. It's what we would like for you. You've got to close the gap between intentions and actions. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. We have finished the Song of Song book. If you haven't read it, you can go back and read it. If you missed the messages where we 
talked about how to love well, about the seasons of relationships, about conflict, feel free to go online and check those out. Each and every week at Heritage, we have next steps. These are steps that we take to grow in our faith. We believe that when we write stuff out, sometimes it helps us to be mindful of it. And also, you need to know that we pray over those for you and whatever's going on in your relationships. Your next steps this week begins with this week, I will close the gap by doing the following. Where's a place where you've got good intentions, but you haven't been following through with action? I know what mine is. I know what I'm mm. going to do. I can't tell you, though, because it's a surprise. Okay. Uh, maybe you've been coming to Heritage for a while, and you're interested in learning more about Heritage, and you would like to partner with us and become a member of Heritage Church. Um, we invite you to come to our No class on March 26th at 11 a.m. We'd love to have you be a part of that. We share a little bit of our history, what uh, our values are, and what a vision is for the future. We invite you to be a part of that if you'd like to. We never want to end a service without giving you an opportunity to put your trust in Jesus Christ. You see, our God is a God of action. He didn't just intend to love us. He showed us that he loved us. He sacrificed on our behalf. And I know that sometimes we come in and we hear about this God and we think, you don't know all I've done. You don't know how far I've fallen. You don't know what a bad person I am. And you know what? When Jesus looks at you, he looks at you through the eyes of love. He looks at you as someone who is beautifully and fearfully and wonderfully made. And Jesus wants to be in a relationship with you. He will forgive your sins. He will give you a new life, an abundant life. And if your heart feels that, don't ignore it. Don't ignore that pool. We won't do a thing in the world to embarrass you. You just mark that on your card, and we will call you and help you take your next steps toward Christ. Maybe you'd like to follow that up with baptism. Baptism is our adoption into ceremony into the family of God, and we enjoy nothing more than bringing out our big giant hot tub and baptizing people in the middle of the floor. We invite you to do that. As part of our worship, we do give back a small portion of what God has given us. We want to offer God our first fruit. We want to offer God the best of what we have to, to offer. If you're our guest here this morning, please don't feel obligated to give to God's mission that we perform. This service was our gift to you. You can give in three ways. You can go to our website. You can text 84321, or you can simply drop a check in the bucket. I did want to share a little something, let you know. You know, a lot of times in churches, you know, I don't want to give to a building. I don't care about the chairs. I don't care about the walls. I don't care about the heating and air conditioning. I want you to know that at Heritage, we view our building as a tool. It's a tool. It's not about the building. It's about the people that come into the building. That's what it's about. So I want to thank you for your faithfulness in that because I want to tell you a little thing that's going on in our, in our church right now. As you remember... In January, we enrolled some mental health support groups, and the word is just kind of leaking out into the community about this. We have seven different groups that we that we are we have launched to support mental health. We also had a request this week for somebody if we had a caregivers group. If anyone's ever been a caregiver and might be interested in doing something for people, there are a lot of people mm -hmm. who are lonely who are being caregivers. If you if you feel God tugging you, that let you know. But but what I wanted to share you with you is that this week. From last Sunday till yet last night at 10 o'clock, there have been seven different people who private messaged the church on the Facebook page saying, I need help. I need to get into your groups. How do I do it? And one of them said this, and I think this is so powerful. She said, I can't do this alone. And you know what the truth is? None of us can do this alone. None of us can do this life alone. We need each other. We need each other. So thank you for your financial faithfulness. Because of you, we're able to be there for people. And we never want to leave a service without challenging all of us because we're a relational and an outward-focused faith. We're supposed to be helping the world, right? And so we ask you each week, who are you in relationship with? Who are you investing in? Who are you inviting, not the church, but into your life? And who are you including in the things that God's doing in your life? So as we walk out of here, have somebody in mind. Somebody in mind that you want to start praying over and focusing on and growing in relationship with. That you can start to share your life and maybe even your faith eventually with. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you were the author of relationships. You show us the way, the truth, and the life. You said that we are to be with each other as Christ and the church are together. And that just means everything. Father, help us start aiming for that. Help us start closing the gap between our intentions and our actions and the things that we say and the things that we do. 
Help us be those people that are just so goofy in love with each other that everybody sees it and sees you through it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.